everyone. My name is Rachel Ravalette, and I am the Director of Communications for the Episcopal Diocese of Central New York. Today, I'm recording just a short lunch and learn, a short little bite size, watch it while you're taking a snack or having your lunch uh, primer on media literacy and why it's important in uh, in our individual lives, in our communal lives, in our parishes, in our faith communities, in our communities, in our neighborhoods where we live. Um, so today, what we're going to do is we're going to take just a brief introduction to media literacy. We're going to talk about why it matters, and we'll especially look at why it matters in a faith context. And then um, I'll share with you some tools, simple, simple tools for increasing your own media literacy, and then also teaching our children to be media li literate. Our young generations that are coming up are what um, what we call digital natives. They have always existed in the time of high speed, high volume information over the internet. Um, and so as an elder millennial, uh, that's very different than how I grew up and it may be very different from how you grew up too. So these tools that I'll share today are not just good for us as adults, um, but they're good for us as we help to um, support children in, um, in, in, in developing and approaching life as responsible media consumers and sharers. So here we go. So what is media literacy? So first, maybe we need to back up a little bit and explain what do we mean when we say media? So one of the things that we'll talk about is that you need to question where information, where media is coming from, um, and if that person is an expert. So let me tell you a little bit about my background. Before I came to the Diocese of Central New York, I worked for the Brian Lamb School of Communication at Purdue University, where I taught and worked as a communications director. Um, so Brian Lamb, if you don't know, is the founder of C-SPAN. He's a Purdue grad. We're very, very proud of him. Um, and we're very grateful to follow his lead when it comes to transparency and questioning and being critical consumers of information. So I've taught media literacy and um, source criticism, critical thinking to undergraduates and graduate students for years. Um, so media literacy, um, again, we're going to break it down first and say, okay, what is media? And broadly, media is any communication outlet that is used to distribute information, entertainment, or data. So a lot of times when we talk about definitions of communication, um, we can break it down to the simplest version, which is too simplistic in a lot of cases, but for our purposes today works well. And that's what we would call the conduit metaphor. The idea that communication can be explained um, by thinking about if we had an item, let's call it a little package, maybe from Amazon, a nice little package, an idea that then we would share as a sender, share it with someone else as a receiver. So in the case of this lunch and learn, I am the sender, you are the receiver. And that idea is this discrete package. And the way it gets from sender to receiver is through a conduit, through a channel. And that's media, the way the ideas go from one place or one person to another. Kind of simplistic, but that helps us understand that this is more than just what we would call traditional media, like newspapers, um, the evening news on network TV, um, but media is any channel that distributes information, entertainment, or data. So let's expand that. Now that we have a working definition of media, what is media literacy? So first up, we have this definition for media literacy now, which is a nonprofit organization that focuses on increasing media literacy, especially in the United States. So the definition that they use is that media literacy is the ability 
to decode media message, including the systems in which they exist, assess the influence of those messages on thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and create media thoughtfully and conscientiously. So let's break that down by the three main verbs in that. So first we have decode. That's the ability to like critically look at what is what it is that this little package, this discrete idea is. Um, what's happening here? Where is this information coming from? What is the purpose of this information? Is it to inform, um, persuade, entertain, agitate? Um, who is going to benefit from me seeing and receiving or absorbing or sharing this information? Who is going to be harmed by me seeing, receiving, absorbing, sharing this information? Um, so decoding kind of what's going on. So I've received this message from this channel. What's going on behind the message? This leads into assessing the influence of that message on the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So what is my reaction? Kind of pausing and taking, instead of just getting the information or entertainment, the message, and then reacting, pausing and assessing, okay, what impact is this message having on me? How does this make me feel? What does this make me think? The benefits from me feeling or thinking that way? Um, what actions? is this making me want to do and it, and is that an appropriate reaction and then finally create how am i contributing to this message or this message issue or space how am i contributing to this conversation um what unique point of view or information could i bring am i the right person to contribute to this conversation or are there other voices i could be i could be covering with when I put my voice in there, voices that are better suited to speaking to this particular issue. Um, who are the experts here? Um, is this message coming from experts? And so if I create media here, am I taking oxygen away from an expert? So that's a really helpful working definition. Um, I also want to share with you this definition from the National Association of Media Literacy Education. So their definition is even simpler. It is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. So access, think about traditional literacy. Do I have the skills to um, when this is presented in front of me to be able to access what the message is behind it. Do I know where to go to find reliable information or um, life-giving entertainment? Um, do I have the skills to be literate in this situation? Um, do I know where to find the information I'm seeking? Um, analyze and evaluate. How trustworthy and reliable is this source? Is this media presenting a message that is fact-based or opinion-based? And how can I know? How can I check? Create, again, what perspectives do I have in this area, arena, conversation that could contribute to it? Uh, and act. Does the action I'm taking as a result of this information follow logically? Who benefits from me acting? And do I have all the tools and information I need to act responsibly? So those are kind of across all sectors, universal definitions of what it means to be media literate. But I'm addressing this topic today because just last week we had a summer learning series about um, AI and we talked about one of the things that we need to be aware of is that there is a lot of AI-generated content that is available online. Um, and it looks like content from people. And so we have to be especially media literate, make sure that what we're seeing, what we're hearing, not just messages we're reading, but also videos. We've heard about deep fake videos and 
AI has the ability to create content that looks like it's coming from a person when it really isn't. And so we need to be savvy. We need to be able to understand what we're looking at and evaluate it. But we don't just talk about this because it's good civic practice. It's a good way to be a productive citizen, um, to be media literate and to promote media literacy. We also talk about this because this has a big impact on our faith. So if you follow along with our podcast, Speaking of Faith with Bishop Dee Dee, you'll know that um, through at least at the end of the year, we're going to be focusing on how we can speak of our faith and speak from our faith in ways that contribute to civil discourse. So as I was preparing for this Lunch and Learn today, I thought, okay, what does media literacy mean for us as people of faith? So here's what I've come up with as kind of a working definition for our diocese. So as we strive for our vision of a world healed by love, media literacy is the intentional choice and honed skill of consuming and contributing in a positive, loving, and responsible way to civic dialogue as we speak and live our faith. So digging into that a little bit, our vision in our diocese is what what we want to see in the world, what we are acting, what we are living out our mission towards to hopefully realize is that we would be in a world healed by love. And of course, inherent is that, is that God heals the world by love and that we want to be part of that work, of that holy and sacred healing and repairing and restoring of God's good creation. And so as we think about our vision, we need to be asking ourselves, are the words that I'm consuming, the, the media I'm consuming, are those healing me? Are they helping me to love more or love better, including love myself better? Does it heal or harm my community to be engaged with this content? Second, that media literacy is an intentional choice and a honed skill. I think if we all are honest with ourselves and with each other, we can say that being careful and cautious consumers of information in this time of such divisiveness does not come naturally. It is a natural human instinct to, to want to protect ourselves uh, by surrounding ourselves with our tribe, by taking a side and feeling strong in that side um, it is a human instinct to react based on fear. It's a survival instinct that now has come and translated into the civic discourse. We're no longer being chased by saber-toothed tigers. Um, at least I haven't been chased by a saber-toothed tiger in my lifetime. Um, but we feel the survivalist instinct of still wanting to protect ourselves. And so being media literate means that we are choosing to, instead of being reactive, to, I would say, and, and author Brian Zond uh, says this, the opposite of being reactive is not being proactive. It's being contemplative. You have to choose to, when you see a message, before you react, contemplate, slow down, make sure that you're act, um, decoding, assessing, evaluating, analyzing um, the media. Um, we have to choose to move from that lizard survivalist protection brain to our prefrontal cortex, to our executive functioning. Um, and it's something that we can get better at by practicing. Just because it doesn't come naturally to us doesn't mean that we can't um, practice that together. 
And so then positive, loving, and responsible. We need to recognize the impact that our consumption of different media and then our sharing or creating of different media has on ourselves, on our own faith journeys, on our relationships with God, our relationships with ourselves, with our family, with our friends, our faith communities, our uh, local communities, and our world. Communication is a great gift. Communication is what makes relationships possible. We are relational beings created by a triune relational God. It is the creator God who gives us the creative and generative gift of communicating. We can make things happen with our words, just like we read in, um, in the creation stories of God speaking the world into existence through relationship. It is the creator God who, through Jesus, teaches us what healing, restorative, loving communication looks like. Now, don't, don't get it twisted. Healing, positive, loving, restoring communication isn't always just being calm and being passive. We see examples from Jesus where he was calm, where people questioned him. And instead of rising to the bait, he sat down and drew in the dirt until the fire went out of the challenge they brought to him. And then he just continued by saying, go and do likewise. Be, um, by, he took from that moment of calm, he set an example. But Jesus also communicated in big ways, in powerful ways. Think about, you have heard it was said, but I say to you, you've gotten this message, but hear this, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And we see Jesus in the temple clearing out these stalls, um, these vendors. There's a Presbyterian author, and her name is escaping me right now, but she describes the temple as a place where divine blessing and human lives meet. So Jesus comes into the temple. He sees this marketplace, which really was a service for the pilgrims who were coming and didn't want to like travel with a menagerie in tow for their sacrifices. But he also sees in this marketplace how power and prestige of the elite, the temple elite, and the principalities and powers of the day were all wrapped up in this place and keeping it from being a place where divine blessing and human lives could meet. And Jesus, in a moment of brilliant political theater, drives these vendors out of the marketplace that sent a message and it was a message that was intended to heal to be loving to be restorative and it was not passive and so by saying that we need to connect to media literacy to our faith i am not saying friends that we need to just sit back and be meek little church mice in the face of messages that harm, in the face of messages that mislead, whether intentionally or by mistake, misinformation or disinformation, that dis prefix um, bringing in the connotation of intentional misleading. We need to use the gift of communication from our creator God to love to restore, to heal. And media literacy has to be part of that. All right. So why does it matter? Media, and this is from um, FutureLearn, uh, but media is how we stay entertained, connected, and informed. The number of times, friends, that I have been like, all right, I'm just going to shut down all of my personal social media. 
then I run into the reality of your communications director. You need to be on social media. You need to know what's going on on social media. And, but also like, I want to know what my family members who I don't get to see very often, what their lives are like. That's a real gift of social media. Um, I like being entertained. I like reading. I like reading nonfiction. I re like reading uh, fiction. I love, love, love Maisie Dobbs mystery novels. Um, and it's important to me to be informed. Um, part of my daily practice is not just paying attention to the news, but praying the news. So as I listen to my morning news podcast, praying over the news, praying over the world and the hurt, so media is important. And the latest estimates, the latest statistics show that Americans spend an average of 473 minutes each day consuming media. That's wild. That is wild, my friends. 473 minutes media is a part of our lives and so we need to be able to engage with it responsibly so think with me for a moment about the ways we receive consume and share media and information and how those have changed in your lifetime so i'm going to give you some examples of how the way we receive and consume information has changed throughout u.s history and now I'm going back before any of this. So just to be clear, I do not think that those of you who are watching this could relate to having personally experienced um, some of the ways information is shared um, that I'm going to highlight here. But these are important moments to see how this has changed in not too much time. So the first thing I have here is um, a sign about Juneteenth. So Juneteenth, June 19th, 1865, two years, more than two years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by then President Lincoln, news finally reached the enslaved persons in Galveston, Texas of the end of slavery. So for two years, information was kept from these people uh, who were living in slavery and bondage in Galveston, Texas. Now, there is a degree to which news did travel more slowly then, but don't get it twisted. A few people had news, and not only did they have the information and have that control, they also controlled who heard about it and when they heard about it. Yes, it took longer to get information from New York to Washington, D.C., to Atlanta, to Galveston than it does today. Nobody could pick up a phone. Nobody could shoot off a text or an email. But friends, it did not take more than two years. And so, you know, we can go back even further and look at Paul Revere riding through the night to let people know that the British were coming. Um, and yes, that was slower. And I want you to notice how when we look at Juneteenth specifically, the control of who controlled who got that message, what the message was, and when they got it was still very much a part of our information and media systems. Next, uh, I don't know if you can see there, but that's um, FDR. So to me, he's really um, emblematic of the radio age um, that this is when we really started to get more democratic and universal access to mass media. So his fireside chats, for example, were very important. But also when you think about now media or news and information is being shared through radio. And even if people weren't able to have a wireless in their home, they could go to the local um, fuel station or general store and listen together to news from across the country and across the world. Um, we think about things like the War of the Worlds, dramatic reading on radio that actually incited mass panic because people thought it was actually happening. Um, 
radio um, played a huge role in both world wars um, in not just how we received information, but how warring armies and navies communicated with each other. Um, so that was, is a major shift from just not that long before um, in 1865 on Juneteenth. Moving forward, um, the assassination of JFK, I think, is a major touchstone, a major milestone in how our media landscape has changed. Um, for four days, the three networks covered the assassination of JFK, and everyone gathered together as Walter Cronkite delivered the news, right, that, that the president had been shot and died around 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, and that was really the first time you saw this kind of continuous coverage. Um, moving forward, we could think about um, TV and its impact. Like, um, now we're getting into my lifetime, the Challenger explosion. Um, children gathered in their classrooms to watch as a teacher goes into space. Um, and then this disaster on live television. Um, and then, of course, um, September 11th, 2001, uh, played out on live TV across hours. Uh, and, and, and I don't know where you were, but I know where I was. <laughs> and we all have those media moments, right? We remember when we, where we were when we heard that JFK was assassinated, when Martin, we heard that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, when um, the Challenger exploded, when um when the september 11th attacks were happening and that was continuous media coverage on network tv on cable tv nobody knew what else to do except to just sit and consume over and over again um and um there's that's had a huge psychological impact on the world um but we can see how the ways we've received and consumed and shared media have changed in the history of this country, but even just in our lifetimes. I'm 38. Um, I was born in 1986. And think about how differently information was received in 1986 versus 2024. So I don't think I'm that old. I am what they call an elder millennial, which just feels rude. Um, but, but even in my lifetime, things have changed so quickly. So we also have to bring a faith perspective to this. Um, let's look first at some words from Jesus. I mentioned earlier that Jesus, uh, Jesus teaches us how to use this creative and generative gift of communication. Um, and so bringing, when we think about why media literacy matters from a faith perspective, it's not just it impacts our faith communities and our communities. It impacts the value of us witnessing to Christ's love, um, the way we communicate and what we communicate. But we can look at scripture also to kind of ground us in this. So verse um, Luke 6, verse 45, um, and all of these verses I'm bringing you are from the New Revised uh, Standard Version, the updated edition. But so Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good. The evil person out of evil treasure treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. It's a really powerful passage. I think kind of the some translations say out of the overflow of the heart. So what are we filling our hearts with, friends? Um, so media literacy is not just about being able to tell this is true this isn't um this is this is fact-based this is opinion-based but it's also like am i going to let this take up residence in my heart is this going to be part of what fills up my heart and if it is what is that overflow of my heart going to look like when i communicate when i communicate through words when i communicate through actions um, so that I think is a really helpful and beautiful challenge from Jesus. Moving on, Philippians 4, 8, you know where this is going. 
finally siblings, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And again, that same kind of idea, what we fill our hearts and minds with shapes us and how we are in the world. Also from Paul, we have Ephesians 4, 29. Uh, Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. So now moving beyond the idea of just what we consume impacts us and how we live impacts our hearts, but it impacts those around us. Is me consuming this and then sharing it or consuming it and then acting out of the reactionary feelings that I have about it? Is it building up? Is it healing or is it harming? You know, we think about the Hippocratic Oath and first do no harm. This idea that we want to be putting good and love and healing into the world, into our relationships, into our communities. And so not just out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, but what is the impact of what my mouth is doing? And then finally, I just want to commend to you Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and following. This is um, 9 through the end of the chapter is uh, the scripture that Bishop Didi is focusing on in her podcast. Um, I mentioned before that through at least the end of the year, we're going to be talking about how to talk across differences. Um, And so this is kind of our home base passage. And in Romans 12, 9 and following, Um, there are a lot of things about how, um, you should, it starts with let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. But in that passage, we also get so far as it depends on you live peaceably with all. And if we think about that, if we take part peaceably, peaceably certainly isn't harming. Don't, don't live in such a way that's harming those around you. So Again, I, so if you're watching this, my guess is you don't need me to convince you about why media literacy is important, but me being media literate takes effort. And even as somebody who's taught this for years, um, it's good for me to be reminded about why this is hard. Things change fast and it's hard to keep up. Why? This is important for my own well-being, my own mental health, my own spiritual health. Um, And we know that mental and spiritual health have an impact on our physical health. And also why it is important for me as I speak and live out my faith, um, as I do my best to present Christ to the world. All right. So I want to end with sharing with you some tools to support you in a media literacy journal or journey. So first we have these questions from the National Association for Media Literacy Education. And I love these because I think the biggest tool that we have in being more literate, media literate, and making sure that our consumption and sharing of media, especially in this divisive climate is, our actions are healing and not harming. Our biggest tool is slowing down and not reacting. Again, the opposite of being reactive is being contemplative and considering what we have in front of us. And I think having some questions that we ask ourselves, slowing down before we absorb information as truth um, or an accurate reflection of reality, And certainly before we share it with other people, either on social media or in our conversations, in the grocery store, with our family or friends, especially people we disagree with, it's important to slow down. And questions can help us do that. I love these questions they have here, these four questions. Who made this? Where is this coming from? Why? Uh, What is the purpose of this? How do they benefit from this? And again, who is harmed by this? How does this make me feel? Sometimes when these messages are coming at us so quickly and we we get our dander up, it's hard to pause and say, wait, what is going on here inside of me? Am I angry? Maybe. Am I scared? 
Ooh, I am. What am I afraid of? Am I sad? Am I excited? Do I feel emboldened by this? And is that emboldened in a way that reflects Christ or reflects like I've got, I've got the winning side, right? So how does this make me feel? How might different people understand this issue differently? One of the things that we're doing on the podcast right now is kind of looking at our assumptions that we bring to interactions with other people. And the assumption that we tried to get people to try on for a week in our most recent episode is, I have some information, but other people may have other information, right? I can only see from my perspective. So how is somebody else from a different perspective see this? And then what is missing here? This is the hardest one. Um, what information is important to know? When news stories are flying, um, sometimes we just don't have all the facts and we need to be careful about making judgment calls too quickly before we can have all the facts. And a lot of times, because there's this need to have a constant, constant, constant stream of information, think about cable news channels, um, social media, people fighting for your attention. They've got to have something, right, to keep your attention. So we're just going to put stuff out. And speculation is mixed in with facts that haven't been fact-checked. So what is missing here that I need to be really informed about this and to make an informed decision about how I might act because of it or how I might not? So those are really valuable questions. Um, moving on. Newsium is a really great resource. So this is a museum of news media, um, but they also have um, a lot of resources uh, aimed at different age groups, different technology levels about, um, about how to be critical about the media we consume. And so I want to share this, um, with you and I'll share this PDF, um, in the post of this video, but this is an example of some of the resources that the museum has for education. Um, is this story share worthy? So trying to combat the very quick and reactive. I saw this on social media. I'm sharing it. 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 So um, it, re it says here, the First Amendment protects the right to report and publish information, but not every story is worth your text, tweet, or share. This chart can help you find the good stuff and get rid of the garbage. So really great question, here. Is it real? Is it fact-based? Um, if not, is it entertaining or raising awareness? No, we're not sharing it. No, but it is supported by facts. So sure. Or yes, it's raising awareness. Um, is it well-made? So is it from a well-resourced and professional source? News or opinion? Is the bias clear or sneaky? Is it biased? Um, and you'll notice here that the only time we get to an ultimate yes, share it, is if it's unbiased and supported by facts. So that's a helpful chart um, that actually I've used with my own kiddo as she's not on social media yet. Um, she's only, she's about to turn 12, but um, her friends are starting to be like, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this. And right now it's like stuff about Taylor Swift or Jojo Siwa, but pretty soon it'll be about news and issues that we care about. And so helping to build media literacy and her, I think is a really important part of my job as a parent. Does this smell funny? The fart test. I don't love this acronym, but I love it for kids because it will get their attention. So um, this is something I found through educational resources for media literacy. And it's just, it's an acronym to help you remember which questions to ask. So is the site friendly to the eyes? Is it easy to read or is it, does it have a lot of things that are trying to distract me from it as I'm evaluating this online source of information? Um, does it essentially, does it look professional and about the information and not about getting me to do something? A, authority. Does the person who or organization that published this have authority? Do they have the experience and expertise to know what they're talking about? 
should I listen to somebody who isn't an authority? Um, second, R, is the information repeated elsewhere? In other words, are they making themselves this up themselves or are they citing information? And then we've got to do that same round of questions to evaluate that source. Um, when I used to teach freshmen in college about this um, in questioning their sources, I would have them evaluate some sample sources. And one of them was this really professional looking website about the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide and how it's in all municipalities and rural areas in the United States. People can use it in a way that is unregulated. If you have too much of it, it can impact your ability to breathe. Um, if you, and, and so, and the site, it says, you know, it looks current. It has an up-to-date date on it. Um, it uses sciencey words and charts. And I said, okay, is this a valid source? My students would say, yeah, it's up-to-date. I mean, I'm really worried about this. This must be real. Friends, dihydrogen monoxide is H2O. So this was a spoof site to show you how if you're not checking sources and you're not an expert in something and they're not backing up the information they're showing you, um, this person doesn't have the authority, this information isn't repeated, that's our R, elsewhere. And then the last part of this test, the T, is is it timely? When was this information published? So if you were looking at information about the impact of social media, on pre-adolescent brain development. And that data was from 2006. Pre-Instagram, pre-TikTok, pre-Snapchat, pre-Vine, if you remember Vine, um, pre-smartphone. Friends, that, that is out of date. But if it's information about geological periods and it's from 1965, it's probably still pretty accurate. There are some things that don't change all that much, right? So timeliness can mean different things on different things and um, in different issues, but especially when we're talking about news and um, evolving stories, um, we need to make sure that we have the most up-to-date information. And I would add to this T here, has there been enough time to gather the facts or is the news channel, the social media um, account, are people just rushing to fill a vacuum? So we had some big news on Sunday uh, when President Biden said he's stepping back and endorsing Kamala Harris. Things have changed so much. Today is Tuesday. It's 12.47 p.m. Um, things have changed a lot since Sunday at 12.47 p.m., right? And that's just a couple days. And so we need to... We need to be careful about making any rushes to judgment um, until there's time to gather facts. This is especially true with disasters, right? Um, sometimes the easy and obvious answer when there's a violent attack, when there is a natural disaster, any number of um, unfolding situations, we need more time to gather the facts and to really understand what is going on. So uh, another tool is the Ad Fontes Media Bias Chart. Um, so I want to show this to you. This is adfontesmedia.com. Um, and they, um, and you can go through, you can look at their methodology for this, but basically they are regularly evaluating um, news sources and presenting this chart for um uh to to help you decide if your news source is uh trustworthy and so on this vertical axis here the lower down it is the less reliable it is and the higher it is the more reliable it is so highest is original fact reporting with a lot of effort and a lot of focus on making sure that we're getting all the facts and presenting them clearly um, and as we go down, we get down to, to um, where there's misleading information and then just inaccurate or fabricated disinformation at that point. 
on the horizontal axis here, we have political bias. Pre helpfully, uh, it aligns with our um, prevailing cultural ideas of left versus right. Um, so I think, and this is, I don't know if I already said this, but this is updated regularly. And when this first started coming out, it was just about news shows, I think on TV. And then we got radio and podcasts um, and social media channels in it now in recognition of the ways that we're getting our information in different ways. So I just want to zoom in here and tell you about how I've used this tool. So the first time I came across this tool, again, I was at Purdue University teaching undergraduate and graduate students, uh, among other things, but how to be a, um, a critical consumer and sharer of information, how to be media literate. Um, and I noticed, and they're even further left and lower now, but my main news sources were the PBS NewsHour, NPR, PBS, and Axios. And I was like, and around that time, they were all kind of up here um, and they move along here a bit, but they, I noticed they were all left. And that is not my reality. That is not my family. Um, and so I was like, I have got to expand where I'm getting my news. I have to be more critical. I still really like NPR. I still listen to Up First, this kind of five minute, fifth actually more like 15 minute news summary um, from morning edition every morning. That's how I pray over the news. But those are no longer my only or even my primary sources of information. And a lot of times the stories that I hear on there, I use those as opportunities to say, okay, before I act on this, I've heard about this story now. Now I need to get dig deeper and make sure I'm digging more towards the middle and more towards the top. Um, so that is a valuable tool. Another um, thing that I would like to share with you is when I realized that I needed to kind of expand where I was getting my information and, and working to be more fact-based and um, more balanced, I came across two sources that I now use as my main sources for in-depth news. The first is Tangled. So Tangled is a daily email. Um, I subscribe there. You can, you can get it for free Monday through Thursday. I subscribe for $60 a year, $5 a month so that I can get the Friday and Sunday editions as well. But this is a team that really focuses on one issue per issue. So it's a daily email. The read is usually about um, 15 to 20 minutes. And the one thing I really like is this is an example from yesterday. If there are corrections to be made, it is at the top of the newsletter. And it says, here's what we said. Here's why this was wrong. Here is the correction. And then they have this running tally. This is our 111th correction in Tangle's 259 week history. And our first since July 16th. We track corrections and place them at the top of the newsletter in an effort to maximize transparency with readers. So I really appreciate that. Um, and then after corrections, there's usually this quick hit section, like here are the developing stories that we're following and you can read more about them here. But then they take a topic. So this is from yesterday. Um, let me find one that's more like a normal news day. Okay, here we go. This is, this is yesterday, or today's email newsletter. Um, and it's a breakdown of the Republican National Convention. And I hear you saying, wait, the RNC wrapped up days ago and they're just now getting to this? Yes, because they're covering it in depth and I'll show you how. Um, and so they're taking the time to get the facts right, to listen to what other people are saying, to help you make a balanced choice. So today's read, 12 minutes. You can listen to it as well. Quick hits. And then it introduces the topic. It says, okay, here's what the right is saying about this with some bullet points. And then it cites sources. So is it repeated anywhere? Yes. Um, and then it says, here's what the left is saying. And then if you want to, you can read the, uh, the, the founder's take on this. So it says here, my take is a section 
where I give myself space to share my own personal opinion. If you have feedback, criticism, or compliments, don't unsubscribe. Write in by replying to this email or leave a comment. Um, and so if you've heard from both sides, and we know that this one side or the other language is really um, limiting and doesn't leave room for nuance, but... Um, but I love that. It shows that kind of balance. And then you can see somebody who's thoughtfully reasoning through it. And sometimes I really agree with Isaac, the founder of Tangled. Uh, and sometimes I really don't. And then I can question either whether I agree with him or not. I can question, okay, what about his reasoning? I think is, do I think is solid? What about his conclusions do I think is solid? And it helps me to more clearly articulate what I think. The other source that I use, which I found through Tangled, because a lot of times the link to it is Ground News, another low price subscription, but Ground News takes topics and says, okay, when we look at, um, let's look at what's going on with Israel Hamas, um, we can see, okay, Hamas and Fatah signed declaration on ending uh, decades long rift. Okay, so that's the topic. That's not going to link me just to a news article. But what I see here is that it's 43% left coverage. The white there is centrist and the red is right leaning coverage. And I can go in and look um, at the bias comparison, what kind of information there is. And then it's going to show me a, as many articles as it can gather. Um, and these, I really appreciate, are not all U.S. centric. There are global news sources here. And for each one, I can say, okay, this one is left leaning, kind of independent, high factuality, center, centrist, high factuality, leans left, high factuality, um, high factuality. And it, this maybe isn't a good example, but there are always, um, let's look, um, 2024 U.S. election. Uh, here's information about Biden's address that's coming up. And we see here that this top hit, mixed factuality. All right, so I'm going to look at that differently. And then there's a quick bias distribution site or chart over here on the right that shows me where the coverage is stacked, which sources fall where, um, and if they're not able to determine bias, it's down here. So again, a really well-rounded, slow way to consume news. And I find that it helps me to be less reactive. So those are some tools, the questioning, the slowing down, the working to become contemplative and to frame things and view things through my faith instead of just my first emotional kind of lizard brain reaction to it. Um, these are tools that help me to be more media literate. They help me to um, make sure that the way I'm consuming and sharing information is healing and supporting my relationship with God, all God's creation, and all of God's people. And so I want to encourage you today and every day to practice slowing down and practice media literacy so that we can speak of our faith and from our faith in a way that brings healing to our communities and to our nation and to the world in these increasingly polarizing and divisive times. May you be well, may you be blessed and be a, be a blessing. Thanks friends. <laughs>